Okay, hi, I'm Brian Cardell. I'm a developer advocate at Egalia. And I'm Eric Meyer, also a developer advocate at Egalia. And uh, one of the interesting things about having a podcast is that sometimes like a little thing makes one of us reach out to the other and say, hey, is that something? Like, I have this idea. Is it? Is that a show? Maybe we could make a show out of that. And uh, a little while back, you tweeted about discovering, I think it was the closest method. Yeah, the... Uh... Well, it's a JavaScript thing where you can say there's a closest function for nodes in the DOM. So you can say, you know, if you have a DOM node or, you know, an element or whatever, you say element.closest and then in parentheses section in quotes, and it will select the closest ancestor. Well, sorry, it will select the closest section element that is either an ancestor or the element itself. So if you say element.section and element is a section, that will select that element. But if if your element is a, a, a span and you say element.closest section for that span, it will select the closest ancestor section. So even if there are nested sections, it'll pick the one that's closest to that element in the DOM tree. You can think about it as going with query selector, but going the other way, right? Query selector walks down into the tree, mm -hmm. closest walks up to the root right do, doing tests css works like closest really like when it does its matching it walks up to the root yeah this this surprised me it really grabbed my attention because um these particular things really came from you know we talk about all the time like paving the cow paths and specifically jquery but you know jquery didn't you know john resig didn't invent selectors <laughs> um like he, right. he just sort of like perfected the API around it and became the, the really popular one with jQuery. Uh, but jQuery specifically got involved to create the, the standards team that was like uh, Adi Osmani and Yehuda Katz. There's a whole bunch of people came from that. I, I was nominated by that team to CSS Working Group too. But this group of things, Query Selector, Query Selector, all matches closest. They come from this era and they've been mostly everywhere since like 2015. And they're also really highly polyfillable. So we had polyfills even before that. They've been universally implemented since 2017 when it became Edgium, you know, when Edge became Chromium. Right. So that's when Closest, for example, became. Yeah. Uh, universally yeah. implemented without polyfill support. Yeah. But it's been around for a while. And uh, this thing that sparked my interest is, A, I'm like closely attached to some of these. But also, um, you and I talk about this all the time. Um, we talk about how do you keep up with all the things that are going on? And also the other end of that, the, the sort of really burned in widespread knowledge that sort of, you know, everyone has that it becomes just a thing that you like a reaction almost like you just know it, you know, just know it wrote, you know. Uh, it takes a really long time to learn, like for you to go, oh, yeah, there's a thing closest reach for that. I, I know exactly how to use that without even looking, you know. Yeah. Whereas I only learned about it uh, like a month ago. Yeah. But for that to permeate so that like everybody knows about it, you know, where it's like mm -hmm. just core knowledge that everybody has. It takes a really, really long time. Yeah. It's surprising. It's surprising, right? Like, yeah, sometimes. I mean, for me. That doesn't seem surprising that I didn't know about closest because I don't do a lot of JavaScript like, compared to a lot of people. Like I do some, but I don't do a ton. And so it, it just, it hadn't really been a thing that I was uh, steeped in, if you want to put it that way. <laughs> Whereas with like CSS, I'm constantly surprised that people say, wait, there's an isolation property. And I think to myself, yeah has been for a while or HTML for that matter. A couple, it's been more than a couple of years ago now, but uh, somebody posted about base href and mm. the replies were just a never ending parade of what? That's a thing you can do. When did that get added? And me thinking base href was added. I think when Tim Berners-Lee first wrote HTML, it was added in, at the, the beginning. Dark ages, wasn't it? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think about that stuff all the time and I'm, I'm constantly surprised when I learn new things all the time. Like that, that's still amazing to me. Like I, I'm constantly still learning things all the time. Right. Yeah. And you're, and you think like, how long have we been able to do that? How long have I been working around that? Yeah. 
uh, around my lack of knowledge of that thing. Yeah. Um, so I I thought like it would maybe be interesting to like kind of whip through a bunch of interesting things that happen in a few different eras that like maybe people might have missed and then we'll sort of like talk about the larger problem i guess of trying to keep up and everything so that's what this show will be so as i said like the there was this movement of people from javascript land to helping work on standards and um lots of the things from jquery uh, i think helped shape so lots of the dom apis have been improved do you know there's like um append child and, and things in the dom apis yeah I, I did just recently learn that so so there's some dom apis that have been around for like literally forever but they were missing some that you would think naturally this one implies the existence of that one that you know jquery just added and so it came back and added them to the dom so uh prepend is one replace with mm. replace children uh, I think those are all really interesting. Oh, I just realized I misspoke. Actually, I knew about a pen child for a really long time. It's the uh, next that I I wasn't aware of until very recently. Um, is it called next? I don't know. The thing where you basically say element dot next, and then the argument you supply is another element, and it it, it appends the argument element. You know, the, so if you have span dot next, you know, span, it'll stick that second span in af right after the first one, except it, I don't know if it's called actually next, but there's a, there's a method that, or a function or whatever it's called that does that. Okay. And there's also a, there's a, there's a, like an insert a, a previous, I say, yeah, it's, it's like that, except it's called something else. I can look it up, but okay. yeah. Anyway, um, the, uh, Event listeners, you know, they have an argument where you can make them do once so they only are relevant once and then they just cease mm -hmm. to exist. That's super mm -hmm. handy thing that was first introduced in 2016 and got like very, very quickly to universal implementation in like 2017. That one's really handy. I think template is probably one of the hugest things. And that also came from that same era. It started in you 20. Mean like, you mean like template literals, that kind of thing? No, that also came from similar era, but I mean like the template element. Ah. So, okay. like, people have been doing client side templating using something like mustache or handlebars, or, you know, there's lots of, lots of them for a really long time. When you want to do AJAX and update the DOM, you need to do the same thing you do on the server, which is like fetch some data and then stamp out some HTML. So there have been yeah. client-side template libraries for a long time. And the way that we would embed them was a kind of a clever hack. That was to put a script element in your page with a type that was an unrecognized type. So like text slash mustache dash template. And then it won't execute that and it will use the script parser, but it, you know, it won't basically it'll just skip the stuff in the script more or less. And then right. you can pick it up and, and stamp it out. That is an almost elegant solution. Um, the reason that it's not elegant is because the parser will still find things like an empty image element in there. Like an mm -hmm. image element that doesn't have a source yet or has like a source that's dollar sign, curly braces, something, you know, and it will right. actually try to request that. If you tried to put some like nested script in there, that gets weird. Like you want something that when you register this element, it executes the script and you just put a script tag in there. Seems, feels natural in a way, but it just doesn't really work. So template solved right. all of those things. It It created a way for us to say there is some dom like the stuff in here is real dom but it's inert like you just parse it as dom and then you can grab a document fragment from that but it doesn't go and like load its contents and do all that stuff you know um so you you can do all that with template and template is really cool and it is now the basis for declarative shadow dom too so yeah, yeah that's there a, we go it's a real good one to look into if you haven't yeah it makes sense so I I was aware of the the element, but not the I I haven't looked a lot at declarative shadow DOM. I've sort of skimmed over it. 
and I didn't realize they were using template there, but that makes totally makes sense. And the thing I was thinking about before is actually called after, not next. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, you can say something like input dot after button, and then it'll stick a button in after your input, that sort yeah. of thing. I believe there's also a before. I'm pretty sure there's a before as well. And does um, it also take a node list? Like you can pass it n node? I don't know, actually. I've never used it that way. I've only ever used it basically once. So it wouldn't surprise me if you could pass it a, like a node list or a, a subtree effectively, yeah. but I, I can't say for sure. Anyway, like these are the things that, that I, you know, we've just recently learned, like for a long time, if I needed to add an element into an existing structure, I was doing the whole append child thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it's like, well, I don't want it at the end. <laughs> I want it yeah. somewhere in the middle. So I'm actually going to have to build this whole thing from scratch. Basically, I'm going to have to use JavaScript to like either tear apart the DOM that's there and then reconstitute it the way I want it, or I'm just going to have to build it from the JavaScript and not have any markup in my document in that place. And now that I know about after, I don't have to do any of that stuff. <laughs> I can just pick the element that I want to put something right after and be like, okay, put something after that. Boom, done. Yeah. Woot. I don't know when that got added. Uh, I, I could look it up on MDN or uh, can I use or whatever, but that probably has been there for quite some time. And I only just learned about it uh, within the last month or so. Yeah. Uh, match media, I think is another one that a lot of people are still learning about. Uh, surprises mm -hmm. me, but uh, I guess you you learn about a trick and then you live with it for a long time and other people didn't learn about that because they didn't have the need so it just you know right. there's no excuse for them to learn it but um it is a javascript api that lets you like basically respond to events for media queries so this media query suddenly matches or doesn't match so it's sort of like a javascript version of add media and css where the browser just sort of listens for changes to the media environment. And then you can essentially do a, you know, if uh, match media below 640 pixels, then do this JavaScript. Yeah, right. So that's that's pretty much what that is, except if you're only doing CSS, of course, you just want to use add media and CSS. But I can see where you would use this to uh, wash my mouth out with soap afterwards for saying this, but, you know, you use it to construct a hamburger menu when you get to mobile sizes. You you could sure yeah, I said hamburger menu. I'm so I'm sorry, but anyway, yeah. So there's that API which I don't know that I, I knew about. Um, it's I haven't been around for a long it. time. Yeah, 20, 2010, 11, 12, somewhere around there. But it was supported in IE ten. I mean, it's been around a long time. The uh, CSS supports API. I think some people still learn about that. It yeah. had choppy yeah. support until about twenty seventeen, but. That also first appeared in the Opera in 2012. It's been everywhere since like 2015. Uh, that's really, really handy. Yeah, add supports for feature queries, which mm -hmm. most listeners will probably know about. But for those who don't, you basically can say add supports, color, and then give it an OKLCH value. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if it returns true, then anything you put inside the add supports block will be run by the browser. And if it returns false, then it won't. So you could do all of your okay LCH centric styling inside there. A lot of people use it for things like at supports display grid. And then if it if the browser supports grid, then you do all of your grid layout in there. Or at least they did. I don't know if people are really doing that anymore given how long grid has been supported now, but that was very popular for a while. Yeah, that's exactly the use case, right? So you have some powerful new great thing like grid and you're like, oh my God, I can do such great things with this. But, you know, what if for the first few years you don't have grid? Uh, grid was not so much like that because everybody mm -hmm. worked on it at the same time. We got it released like very quickly. But yeah, I mean, even if everybody releases at the same time like grid, um, you will have a percentage the trailing percentage of that does not hit anything like 100% as quickly as you would imagine. I mean, we never really can get to 100%, but to get as high as we're probably going to get, it can take like three years, which is amazing to think about. We should, we need to do a show about that once that's all done. But 
uh, I don't know. There's like lots of console methods. Um, the reason I put this in here is that um, Paul Irish was also involved in a whole lot of these things. And for a brief time, he and I were going to start a console standard. And we actually even started the, the work on that. Uh, then eventually uh, Terran Stocks picked it up. And I don't mm. know what happened with it, but th this was a big deal because we, I know we talked about this on the show before, but like back in the day, there wasn't even a console period. <laughs> True. Yeah. <laughs> and then when Microsoft came along, Microsoft added their console and you had it, but only as long as the debugger was open. Yeah. Right. No sense at all. Just no sense at all. But there you have it. Right. And then there were all these like differences between Chrome's and Firefox's and there was no standard around them, not, not in any kind of way. And so yeah, um, yeah. these console ones like time and time end were kind of like the first ways that we could like measure how long a, a thing took. That was pretty cool. Oh, it's still is that, is, is that what they do? Yeah. Yeah. It's still kind of useful. It's for kind of like instrumenting time on your things, but that first appeared in Safari in 2009. <laughs> It also was supporting IE 11. Like this is a long time that's been there, and I bet a lot, I bet most people don't know about it. So you like put in your JavaScript console dot time, and that will output the current milliseconds or whatever <laughs> since the Unix epic uh, out to the console. That's what happens. It's like a way that you mark the beginning and end of a thing. Okay, and then like it it can log the elapsed time in there. Um, okay. Yeah. So instead of having to do the whole let time equal new date and then later doing the math yourself, getting another time point and subtracting from the first time point and then console.log, whatever the result of that is, you just put in console.time and console.time end where you would put those two bits and it will do all that for you. Yeah. And if you just do it in a single function, it just uses sort of like a global thing, but you can also pass labels. So if you're dealing with things that are like asynchronous, mm. it will label them and, and track the, the timers independently. Right. So, oh, nice. Yeah. Very it, cool. Yeah. It's, I, it is actually really, it is really nice. Um, yeah. And I know that there are other console methods. I don't know the names of them, but you, like you can style your console output to a limited degree. Yeah. Yeah, you know, make make things bigger or bold or change color or whatever. What else have we got? In console? Yeah. Uh quite a lot, actually. Maybe too many. Uh there's ways of uh grouping. We just normally use like console.log, but there's also like console.warn, console.trace, console.info, console.error. And, you know, these are all so that when you look in your dev tools, there's filters, right? And they're like progressing mm. higher and higher. I mean, this is the way that like a lot of loggers work in, in a lot of languages. So I don't know how much everybody's just familiar with that already. But yeah, there's uh, counters. There's like things that will that you can call that will automatically count the number of times the thing has happened. I don't know. It's worth mm. it's worth looking at just like... Um, console in uh mdn yeah search mdn console and it will probably drop you your yeah. first result will probably be the console api page which will list all the instance methods and stuff like that yeah or just go to mdn and type console api and it should yeah yeah console.table you can display tabular data as a table that's pretty cool yeah, so I don't know. We can just kind of like whip through. I had a bunch of other notes about other things from this same sort of era, I guess. The insert adjacent HTML, which is the one I thought you were talking about, is a honestly powerful but weird API. Mm -hmm. It dates back to 2009. It was even had partial support in old versions of IE, maybe. Here's one that I think a lot of people don't know, but is really powerful. Do you know that add event listener has a, the third argument that sometimes people don't even pass, but usually people just put false. Do you know what that is for? I do not. It's so way back. Um, if you recall, there was not a standard event model or Dom or anything. Right. And right. so Microsoft had one set of ideas and Netscape had a different set of ideas. Microsoft's idea was that the thing should bubble up to the root, 
right? So you do something and then everybody gets a chance to handle that event. And then you can say, I handled it. Nobody needs to worry about it. Or you can handle it and let the event keep bubbling to the root and people can catch it and do more things with it up higher. And Netscape was exactly the opposite. Netscape had what they called the capture model, where you start at the root and you walk down to where the thing happened. And so mm -hmm. the compromise in the end was that the default thing would be bubbling, but you could pass a true for that argument and it would capture. Huh. And that is really interesting. And I do use it sometimes, usually for things that are like polyfilly kind of things. Okay. Because you want to say, no, I'm getting it first, right? Before anybody else it's handy it's worth knowing yeah the there's a, a current script uh that probably you should never use um and <laughs> okay it, so moving on <laughs> yeah let's not talk about that one there's uh url do you think people everybody knows about url as a i mean API? i could i could easily say yes because i know about it but that's the problem that we have right so yeah let's just mention it briefly yeah, I think Anna Van Kesteren was uh, really instrumental here. Um, you would think that URL, like it was one of, Tim Berners-Lee literally said, like it is the most important thing of all of the <laughs> HTTP, HTML, and URLs. URLs are the thing. Like that's the idea, <laughs> right? right? Like, yeah. Um, you would think that there would be an API for that, but there was not an API for that. And turns out that this whole idea of like uh, rough interoperability and running code yeah. is how it really has worked for all these years. And yep. there was not actually something we could say, this is the standard in, right. in a truthful way in the web platform specifically. So there had to be like a lot of, you know, reverse engineering and bug opening and figuring out what we could make compatible and everything. That was all like precursor work to a lot of the stuff that's in the web platform and to the fetch work that he was doing. Uh, so yeah, that's, it's really great too. Like it's, it's good API. If you ever need to do anything with URLs, it's, I can't yeah. imagine that we, I can't imagine because I live with it for a long time without having <laughs> it and having to write and figure that stuff out myself is Have, somehow grab the, you, the whole URL and then implement your own parsing of it. You mean? Yeah, it, you know, yeah. it's one of those things that I think, like, um, if you haven't experienced the pain of doing it, you're like, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't seem that hard. <laughs> like, it's deceptively simple. You think, like, yeah, it should not be that hard. But it is actually really hard. I think a really good example of this is, do you remember, in the DOM, we introduced this concept called a DOM token list. And mm -hmm. that is the thing that, like is only it should i don't think it should be but it is only unless this has changed recently the css api for classes right uh class list dot add remove yeah which we should say by the way there's a class list thing where you can add remove or toggle class names through a javascript api that's exactly one of those that's like deceptively simple right like you think like mm -hmm. well i mean do we even need an API for that? And the answer is yes, very much. Yes, yes. very have, much. It is so complicated to not have it. Yep. Have, having had to code around the lack of that. Yes, we yeah. need it. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, there's, yeah, there's some other ones that we could, we could talk about. Um, I think post message, message channel, outer HTML. I don't know if you know, that's a mm -hmm. thing. Everybody knows about inner HTML, but outer HTML is interoperable, mm -hmm. implemented yep. in browsers now, nice. which is huge too. It's also like a little bit weird, outer HTML, because it's similar to replace with in that like the operation that you're doing is sort of like destroying the thing you're operating on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like it's just taking it out of the tree, you know, but it's really handy. Uh, what else? Actually, the thing I liked from your list was the uh, print events. Oh, yeah? Yeah, because there, there are a lot more events fired by browsers than I think a lot of people realize. An example that's closer to what I'm used to is the animation events. So if you're animating in CSS and the animation starts and runs and ends, but throughout that life cycle, there are events being fired 
on the JavaScript side that you can have things listen to, right? You can listen for the end of an animation so that you wait to do something until an animation has completed. And there are print events, right? There are print start and print end or whatever they're called, but there are events that are fired when printing starts and when printing ends <laughs> and probably other events as well. And I don't, you know, I don't know how often people will need those, but when you need them, it's real crucial that they be there kind of like with the animation events and, and so many other events. Like I feel like browsers are just firing these events all the time, like for all of the stuff that's happening. And, and most of us just a don't realize and B I think maybe don't grasp how much there is there to act upon. Yeah. Do you know, is there a way to get browsers to just log like all of the events that they're firing? Because that seems uh, like that would be super useful to just listen for. I mean, somebody could certainly write a thing and maybe somebody already has. I, I haven't gone to look, but it just sort of occurred to me. It would be interesting to see what's happening as I. I think it would be impossible. Because mm, I think it would be impossible be. to do an unfiltered list because even mouse move is an event. Yeah, and that's true. Scroll is an event and. It would just get really, really out of control, but it would be interesting. I don't know if anybody has like put together some, you know, like one of those giant wall charts or something <laughs> of all <laughs> yeah. the events. There are so many events. Well, now I have to go looking for a wall chart and see if I, you know, has somebody like done it in a visually pleasing way so you can yeah, print it out at Kinko's or whatever, frame it and put it on your wall so that you yeah. have like this nice piece of art. So people come in and are like, oh, that's a really interesting piece of geometric art. And then when you look closer, it's like, oh, these are all the events. <laughs> yes, yeah, make a nice oil painting. Um, so I, I have one more that I want to add because I think it's, a, it's an interesting and important one that I bet most people don't know. Uh, Sub-resource okay. integrity. Do you know that one? Say that again? Sub-resource integrity. You lost me, coach. <laughs> Okay, so uh, tell me if you have ever, like, you've used maybe jQuery, right? For the sake of argument, sure. Sure. And, like, like a lot of people, maybe you loaded it off of a CDN, right? Like, you're like, okay, well, okay. there's a CDN that has jQuery, and I'll post it from there. Because in prior days, we used to say that you would then share the cache, which is no longer true. But, mm -hmm. like, at least today, we say, well, you get it from the edge that way, right? Like, they have edge servers, so they'll get it faster be more reliable but they do go down they do get compromised you're not in control of them right okay maybe whatever happens you know it it would break so what do you do if you want the benefits of a cdn whatever you perceive those to be <laughs> but yet you need to have some control over knowing what you're actually including right like you have to say no but i need that control to know that the code that i'm including in my page is not compromised i'm okay including okay. this specific script but only literally exactly this specific script okay so i don't know if you ever remember the days of like two cows and all those when we would go and download yeah. things or download yep. their own source forge or whatever and they would always have mm -hmm. a here is a verification. If you if you hash to the mm. same hash, right. then it's the same thing. Yeah. Here's the MD5 fingerprint or whatever. That's what SRI is. So uh, yeah. sub-resource integrity is an attribute that you put on your scripts or style sheets or whatever. And it includes a hash. And it says that you don't execute this if that hash is not true. Huh. If that hash doesn't happen, then, well, you, you can't be trusted. Right. It's kind of interesting. Um, I, I feel like it's a little yeah. incomplete still. And uh, I followed its development with great interest because, well, yeah, maybe this is a good place to pivot to the perils of trying to keep up. It's hard, right? Like, uh, Yeah, it's real hard trying to keep up. Particularly, I mean, you were talking about, and I thought made a great observation, that it's particularly hard if you're trying to stay up to date with the absolute latest that's being discussed. Yeah. It's nearly impossible to do that in a not narrow way in my experience. Like there's just no way that you could keep up with the whole web platform as it's developing all the time. Like we just talked about, I don't know, a hundred different APIs, right? 
It was a whole bunch, yeah. But you could take one of those, like template, just the template one. You know, it was like a, a few years of discussions on that. And if you were trying to follow along at the time, like, I don't know how many tens or dozens of hours of my life I've dedicated to that one specific thing. And you have to keep mentally keep track of all the changes and the the problems that arise and the objections that came up. And <laughs> Right. I've been having this even at a distance with the temporal API in JavaScript, which is all about fixing date, basically. Great, great example. Great example. Yeah. Yeah. Where when I first came on at Agalia a couple of years ago, actually almost three years ago, the one of the first projects was the temporal team was working on implementation, but part of the uh, stated goals was to get temporal documentation onto MDN. So I took all the temporal documentation and I basically, you know, worked it into the MDN format so that there would be this whole structure of the way that MDN works, where there's a there's a overall page for the API, and then for each part of that API, there's a sub page that then links out to all of, all of the methods and instances and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, there have been changes since. And so it's never shipped on MDN because there hasn't been enough deployment of actual implementations. Um, and so it's sitting in a branch that's now quite old and whatever changes have happened will at some point have to be reflected or we'll just have to start over. I'm not sure which, but you know, had I basically been stuck in to the details the whole time and like updating as I go, that would be a part-time job probably. Yeah. And, and like also worth noting that like for you keeping up is easier still than the people who are actively working on it. Right. Yeah. Cause like you can follow from a distance and you can get the two page summary from them and then ask them mm -hmm. some questions yep. and compress your learning into much smaller sessions than, than them who are, you know, working on this all the time. Then they go do a little implementation. Then they have to wait for so-and-so to come and talk. And then together they make some more changes and they have to loop in more people. And it takes yeah. a lot, the closer you are to the solution, the harder it is to follow that stuff. And um, yeah, the CSS you, working and, group members put it like deal with this all the time. Yeah, exactly. So, so like we just talked about template was an example that I used. And I, I'm just saying like, you know, I gave you the, I'm guessing a minute. 30 seconds. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it was not long, but right. it's just like, it is an element template and here's what you do with it. You can go look at it on MDN and it will be like a really, really small page and that's it. Like you can learn about it in, you know, an hour easily, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. In fact, I'm looking at the MDN template page now. It's uh, it's, it's not tiny, but it's not huge either. I could read this page in 10 minutes tops and that's with sort of stopping to ponder the various examples. And, and you but, could then go do some experiments and then you like, probably you'll mm -hmm. like mostly know about that now and you can turn to it whenever you want. Yep. But you know, if you were during the development of that, it was a long time. There's a lot of details, a lot of discussions. Yeah. Um, like, was it called the template element at first or was it called something else? And what was allowed in the template element? I'm sure that changed during that whole discussion. And then how could it be accessed and what was allowed from the JavaScript side that I'm sure that went through a whole lot of iteration. And that was probably, you know, like you say, it was probably a few years of discussion and changing and, oh we're, yeah, we're absolutely going to do this. And then, 18 months down the road, somebody points out, oh, that thing that you're absolutely going to do will absolutely leak personally identifying information. Yeah. You know, and so you can't do that. <laughs> you got to do it either differently or do something else. And then, oh crap, we got to tear all of that out and start over. And yeah. So this, it's a, a bit of a contradiction because we need more people to follow developing things more closely in order mm -hmm. to get more wide feedback earlier, yeah. right? 
Yeah, get somebody to say, oh, um, excuse me, but isn't that thing that was proposed a problem in this way? And then either yeah. everyone looks at it and either says, oh, no, it's not a problem for these reasons or, ah, oh, crap. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think this happens a lot where, like, you get a small group of people working on something and then we get an implementation of it. And then as people start to use it, they have observations that you're like, well, I mean, yep. Sure. Would have been nice to have that earlier. Right. Like if only we had known. Right. Uh, that that's kind of a problem. So I, I don't know, like how we have a particularly gnarly kind of job because we do try to follow like a wide number of things. So like two different extents. I mean, I don't think that you're probably following like TC 39 as much No, And maybe you're following CSS more than I am. And so it's not like we're like literally trying to cover everything, but we have everything to cover sort of. And right. We talk about it a lot, right? Like it's, it's hard to keep up. And even if you are only trying to follow passively, it feels hard to keep up, right? Like I'm not actively following a whole bunch of things and still yeah. it's like, wow, I, like, where did that come from? It feels like that came from out of left field. Like, when did that happen? I completely missed it. Yeah, it's not possible to follow everything. I mean, you, you said that earlier, and I 100% agree. There are not enough hours to be able to follow everything that's happening across the entire web platform. It's just, there's too much. And so there's, it would be useful <laughs> if there were some way to, to know when things have been decided, more right. or less. You know what I mean? And uh, the CSS working group meeting minutes are, I think, a good example of this. Because if you're someone who's just sort of interested in what's happening in, in CSS, like what's being discussed, but you're not somebody who wants to get stuck in to the, the actual nitty gritty wandering through the weeds, trying to cut a path discussion. If you just follow the, the minutes of the weekly meetings of the working group calls, There'll just be a list of these are the things that were resolved in this call. Yeah. And um, if you want to see some of the discussion, you can go check it out. And right. It's like, yeah. Pretty good to the point. People don't minute the, you know, it's, it's not literal translation of every word that was said, but it does, it's a really good job of getting all the important parts. Um, right. Yeah. These, this person made this point, this person made this point, back and yeah. forth. It was this question, this answer, this question, this, you know, we don't know. We'll open a new, whatever. Yeah. So yes, you, there is a link to the minutes from that summary, but the, the summary will just tell you, it's like the CSS working group resolved that in this scenario, this property is interpreted in this way. And I wouldn't say a majority, but a, a notable slice of CSS working group discussions and what resolutions these days are, okay, we decided a thing seven years ago or even seven months ago, and now there's this other thing that intersects with that in a way that was not uh, foreseen. What do we do? So like scrolling to animations, you know, now touch on things like, which, you know, which elements browsers are expected to sort of know what they look like, even if they're not on screen. Yeah. Because the CSS working group is actually concerned with that these days. You know, you, you can't just say, well, only draw the stuff that's on screen, right? Because something could be just off screen and it's likely to come in either due to animation or scrolling or whatever. And if you haven't pre-calculated what that's supposed to look like, then the scrolling would be slow. So browsers have to sort of think about that stuff. And that's actually part of the discussions is given an animation or given uh, view transitions, how do we deal with the way the view transitions affects these other things? Like a view transition is effectively an animation. How does it actually intersect with the animation API that we already have? And in what ways are they different? In what ways, you know, if you have an animation and you're doing a view transition, which one wins? Like, which has the priority? It's just one of many questions that have been discussed um, about these sorts of things. And that's a notable percentage of the discussion is just, okay, now that we're doing this cool thing, 
this way cool thing that nobody probably thought about or even could have foreseen five years ago, 10 years ago, whatever. How are those going to work together? Being able to see the resolution, just a list of resolutions, is a relatively low impact way of keeping up with, oh, I see that the working group has discussed this and they resolved in this way. And you might see that and think, wait, but when I was doing a thing the other week, I really wish that it would default to be the other thing. Maybe I should go to contribute that as a use case for reconsideration or just say, oh, that's cool. I'm glad that they've resolved that. And I see that they're working on things like the intersection of DOM animation and view transitions. And it, it's nice to see that there's progress there. I'm glad that you mentioned the minutes because like, I think about this a lot because, you know, I sort of was doing developer advocacy before I came to work for Galia. The thing that I was yeah. very interested in because I was burning a lot of my personal time, even my like personal vacation time to go and uh, go to CSS working group and stuff like that. And uh, the way that for a long time I kept up with that is that and you're right that is actually a really efficient way of keeping up with things that are happening pretty much on the edge right because anything ultimately needs a working group resolution and it will wind up going through that channel and you can once a week spend i don't know what it would take me 15 minutes or you know not more than half an hour to like really look at it and consume it and you know even go out to linked issues and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, you're right. That was a pretty efficient way to keep up with what was on the edge of things. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I hadn't thought about it because, you know, today I have to use GitHub for a lot of this. Yeah. Do you use, do you use uh, the GitHub like inbox and stuff like that? Not really. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I have, um, Let's see if I can. <laughs> so I cleared this out about 24 hours ago and I have almost 700 things in my inbox for GitHub. Yeah, this is why I don't use that inbox. Yeah, but, you know, today, if you really wanted to follow everything, it would be GitHub. And for CSS Working Group, that means CSS Working Group drafts under W3C. And... The thing with both of those is, though, you are sort of agreeing to take part in speculation, <laughs> you know, because yeah. yep. um, it's very possible that things that you're talking about, even resolutions that are made, will get unresolved. You know, it's uh, more like a bill passing in Congress than it is a change to the Constitution until it's mm. until it's shipped. Right. Then when it's shipped, right, it's right. like that is really, really hard to change at that point. You know, there's lots of stuff that is still speculative, experimental, and people aren't objecting, but they're also maybe not actively participating as much yet. And, you know, things will change and you like, you are burning time that is not guaranteed to pan out at all, much less in the relatively yeah. near future, exactly this way. And today, if you wanted to consume just the CSS working group drafts, it's a lot. I mean, it's like to give you some idea, like there are currently almost 3000 open issues in that repo. There are not quite 4,700 or there are not quite 5,000 issues ever closed. So like, you know, there's a lot, right? There, there's a lot to do. There's a lot to track. There's a lot of discussions and uh, yeah, I mean that it's, almost impossible to follow all that stuff. And that's just CSS, right? It's not MathML. It's not HTML. It's not uh, DOM. It's not JavaScript. It's not DOM. It's not the URL standard. It's not um, SVG. Uh, not that there's a lot going on in SVG, but you know, there's yeah. so many, there's so many standards and uh, yeah. apologies if I, if I missed your repo from the many. Right. Um, there's web platform tests, which all by itself is like a huge thing. It's enormous. Um, there are literally millions of tests at this point. Yeah. So 
I don't know. Like, how do you like what? What would your recommendation? I think a nice way to think about this is like in degrees of how much you want to follow near the edge and and then to like think about what that means. So GitHub is like the biggest, like, you know, that's the shotgun approach, right? Like there's just like a million Hell. things mm -hmm. and some of them you're going to be like, you know, try to grab it as a quiz of the past, right? Like, right. And you're going to miss a lot, but you're going to see a lot and mm -hmm. uh, you can waste a lot of time. Like you can, yeah. you can I don't want to say waste. You, you can, you will invest. You will invest a lot of time or you could invest a lot of time. Right. You could also get really the wrong idea about a lot of things too. Um, True. So you have to spend some time understanding where those things are. Yeah. And for each uh, community, you, you have to take some time to sort of get a feel for what the, what the norms are so that you don't get the wrong impression. Like maybe in one community, there's, there's just a cultural norm of everybody just throws out whatever wacky idea they have as an issue. And then people debate it in detail and then either it gets closed or it continues. But if you're not used to that, if you come from a community where filing an issue means it's already fairly well considered and filing an issue means that there's a real intent to move forward, like you'll get a very different idea and vice versa for that matter. Right. If you come from the, you know, a culture where, any idea you just file as an issue and see what happens. And then you go to a community where we only open issues one after it's been discussed and nobody has raised objections. You're going to feel like, wow, they don't do very much over here. Do they? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. You sort of, if you're going to do that fire hose approach where you're trying to catch stuff in buckets, you also have to understand like what temperature is the water of each of these fire hoses. Yeah. So there's the, I don't know what, what's a good, the scattershot approach that is just everything that we're, you know, we're the big follow it super closely. Mm. Then you're absolutely right. And I, it had like skipped my mind that the mailing list, at least for CSS is a really good one. There is a similar one for um, TC39 minutes are also posted. I used to mm. use that okay. in, in the same way. Uh, now there is what app? <laughs> What up? What up is the one um, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? It's the yeah, the what wig yeah. uh, weekly or biweekly meetings. I don't know how often they are. Yeah. I can't remember, but they also have minutes now. You could look at those, I suppose. I think they're public. Okay. So I, you're right. That's a really good way. But beyond that, I think like you could follow people, read you know their blogs, subscribe to stuff. That's a uh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a way to do it. Um, if people have blogs. So they, like you say, there's the fire hose approach, which is to just subscribe for notifications on GitHub to all of the various repositories. And then, yeah, you'll get hundreds or thousands of messages a day. And yeah, I think the next level back, well, sort of the, the way that I do things is RSS actually. So the CSS working group blog, which has an RSS feed, they publish the minutes of their telecons, like minutes telecon. The most recent is 2023-11-22. And uh, it has, again, all the resolutions. And then there's a, there's a link to the full meeting minutes. And because of the way that the W3C has stuff set up, if you click through to an issue, there will be all of the detailed minutes are automatically posted to those issues. So I subscribe to that uh, RSS feed. I don't know if TC39 has something similar. If they just uh, send summaries to an email list, then I would subscribe to that email list or maybe even try to figure out a way to have that email list ported to an RSS feed. Uh, I also subscribe to the RSS feed for the MDN browser compat data releases. So every time a new release is made for BCD, which is kind of the basis for the, well, it is the basis for the support tables on MDN. And I know it's at least one of the data sources for can I use, but currently a release will show you all of the things that were removed and all of the things that were added to BCD um, in, the, in the current release. 
and then it'll show you some statistics, which I mean, interesting, I guess, but not something I would track. So the most recent release three days ago has, uh, you know, some JavaScript built-ins that were removed and some WebAssembly stuff that was removed from BCD and then uh, JavaScript APIs and some CSS properties that were added in. So that's a way to get a, sort of a high level what's changing in BCD, which is a uh, it's sort of the next step down from all of the resolutions and discuss, the discussions and resolutions that happen in working groups. Then as browsers actually do things, BCD changes. So it's kind of the next step in the pipeline for me. And then I would think if there are blogs you want to follow, the way you find those people is by, you know, when there's a resolution uh, that interests you in TC39 or CSS working group or whatever, and you go and you look at the uh, various discussions and you see, oh, this person talks a lot about this. I'll, I'll pick Adam Argyle because he's in a number of discussions and, and he also puts stuff out. But anyway, you see someone like Adam Argyle and you say, okay, I'm going to track down where Adam is online and follow him there because I figured that when he talks about CSS stuff or JavaScript or whatever, it's going to be something of interest to me. So that's sort of how I would try to find people is that way. And then, uh, you know, if you just follow the sort of the general chatter, you'll see people boosting or retweeting or whatever, wherever you are, people that you decide you want to follow. That's what I would do. How about you? Yeah. I mean, I think I follow a lot of people that is also like, I, I like to follow the whole people. So like, it, it's not a complaint what I'm saying, but it, but it is full of noise. If, if you're also using those channels on social media to try to keep up with interesting things like this right like you will find them but they are almost like the not quite the needle in a haystack but it is very much the scatter shot you have to grab things that are you notice as they whip past your head right like and they're you're sort of black lucky to find them more or less but i think i i follow a lot of people also rss a good one that i wanted to mention is uh, web.dev uh, Rachel Andrew started doing a thing uh, a year or two ago called like new to the web platform in something. So every month she does one of these and she covers like stuff that would be handy for you to keep track of, not just in Chrome, but like in all of the things. Right. So I think that is kind of good. It it does get very mixed up in some, some details that are a little googly maybe sometimes, but but I, I think that's a really good way to keep up with sort of general things because they're they're short. They're not particularly long and they give you just enough information. Um, I also like listening to some podcasts. Uh, Shop Talk Show is a good one. Yeah, I like I like Shop Talk. Shop Talk is a good one. Um, I used yeah. to like the web platform podcast. I, I don't think that they're actively producing those. Um, Jake and Serma and before that, Jake and Paul used to do uh HTTP 203 yeah um, that was that was a great one i don't know i'm just i'm not just gonna you know plug a bunch of <laughs> bunch of podcasts but there are a lot of web development related podcasts and they're, they're sometimes a nice way to you know just go for a walk and listen or you know go for a drive and listen or just have it on in the background and maybe learn something through osmosis usually they're kind of a friendly chat and that's Maybe a not incredibly condensed way to learn about things efficiently, but it's like more enjoyable to just be part of a conversation sometimes. Yeah. I, yeah, I think I, w I wanted to sort of plug a, a thing that I, I wrote an article after you and I had already been talking about this for a year, I think. <laughs> and the article I wrote was last year. I'm looking at it is almost exactly a year ago. Um, the article is called the cool thing you didn't know existed. Okay. And it was, if you recall, I had this idea that you want to think about these things progressively like that, right? Like everybody should not try to follow the CSS working group standards repo, right? Like that would be, it's too much for most people, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody should definitely not do that with every single standards organization repo. <laughs> it's way too much. Okay. Um, yeah you will pick certain things that you want to be more involved in, whether that means like following the repo or like 
the mailing list or, you know, following people and deep discussions, like maybe you follow like Miriam and, you know, look on her social media and she posts all sorts of things. You dig into those. And again, like everybody shouldn't have to do that. But what I think would be really useful for everybody is to have like some way to say like, this is how I keep up with sort of like a basic literacy of what is out there, you know? So like, you don't need to know all the details about all of those APIs that we talked about, but it's like kind of helpful for somebody to be like, Hey, do you know that exists? And then if you have that in the back of your mind, you go, Oh, didn't Brian and Eric like mention something about this? And then, then you can go look, right? Like it's, you need something, you need just enough to know that there are things out there that you can turn to. You don't need to know it wrote or anything. And so I've long felt that the things that actually land in the platform are considerably more rare. So that's what Rachel's thing focuses on every month. Um, the MDN BCD data, the browser compatibility data we worked on and probably should get back to because we just sort of like dropped it because we thought it looked for a minute, like maybe somebody else was going to take it up. And <laughs> if other people want to take it up, uh, I'm all for somebody else doing the work. Right. But maybe maybe we should take that back up because I, I still think that an RSS feed that gives you a really nice, you know, something very equivalent to the sort of CSS working group minutes. It's just like you can think about it like these are the things that landed this week, you know. Right. Um, yeah, there's a proposal in to the Open Web Docs crew to add more information to the BCD release notes that would maybe help a lot with that. But yeah, we had the idea that we sort of, we worked on a bit was to, to try to provide more context for additions and removals from the browser combat data release notes. So that instead of just saying this has been added or this has been removed, it would also say this changed and now it shows support in, you know, two of three engines or three of three engines or whatever. And uh, there is a proposal into Open Web Docs to who managed the BCD release notes and BCD for that matter um, to add more information like that to the release notes themselves. So it might it might happen. Yeah. Uh, but in the meantime, I mean, you know, that would improve BCD and the information there, but that still wouldn't pull in you know, all the other stuff that we've talked about. And I still think one of the things that we should consider doing is is having an RSS feed that doesn't just provide more context for BCD, but also pulls in this CSS working group, you know, re resolutions for the week and TC39 and, and whatever else information Oh, you is. mean like a single high level? Yeah, wow. kind of. That would, you know, could say, you know, the CSS working group had seven resolutions this week and then it maybe tells you what the resolutions were. Or maybe it says, you know, click here to see what they were. You, know, you don't say click here, but you know what I mean? Yeah. And then you can keep drilling down further. Yeah. I mean, we had, we had talked about this at one point. It was, you know, after making BCD information more sort of human readable and useful is maybe start pulling in other things so that there would almost be like, this is the week that was in the web. Um, yeah. I don't know if you like, so little Dan, uh, Darren Ehrenberg, who used uh -huh. to work here and then went to work at Bloomberg, he started all these groups, like these JavaScript groups that were to meet with and discuss things among different sorts of stakeholders. And one of them was educators. And there was like a lot of like, what, what are we going to do exactly? Like, do we want to write MDN documentation? Do we want to, like, what are we going to do? And in that, I proposed that what we lack is this sort of like the evening news for the web, right? Yeah. The equivalent of that, like something that you can sit down for a, a fixed amount of time every week and just keep up. And, you know, it doesn't have to be super detailed. I don't have to teach you how to use this API, mm -hmm. but I can make you aware that it exists and I don't know, sort of how serious it is, right? Like this is done, it's shipped in all the browsers or it just, it's shipped in the second one or, you know, and I think that's doable. It just needs somebody to invest because it's, 
it's a lot. I mean, <laughs> to put it all together, you need yeah. all the data, right? Like it, it's, mm -hmm. it's very difficult, but I would still like to see it. I mean, the closest thing that I have seen to it is the web.dev thing that Rachel is doing. And um, we, I believe maybe that might be partially inspired by the work that we did on TC39 things that reached stage, I don't know if it was three or four, but um, we called it two minute standards. And like it had to be 500 words or less or two minute video or, you know, it was a couple of things you could, you could do. But the idea was a single Twitter account that you could follow and it will never post more than one tweet a day. And mm -hmm. that tweet promises that if you read that article, it will take less than two minutes of your time, you know? So you could have like a, a feed that's daily, although you will never get daily out of that. Um, or you could do like something that's longer. I don't know how long it would be to include all the web stuff, but anyway, I think these are really cool, interesting ideas. I would like to, um, hear what our listeners think. What are, how do you keep up and, and what do you think that we need or we should do, we should have in order to help you keep up. That would be great uh, feedback to hear. So let us know on the social medias. Yeah, I would like to hear both what would help you keep up to date, like in a dream world. And also what's a cool thing that you just learned about recently that you were like, how long has this been here? <laughs> right, yeah. That would also be interesting to hear because I, I guarantee that if you if someone goes into the replies uh, or or comments or whatever and sees, I just learned about this thing, someone else is going to read that and say, I didn't know that thing existed. Yeah. <laughs> and now I do. And that's awesome. Why, yeah. I, why did I not know about that? So, you know, maybe, maybe that's a thing. It's just sometimes I think that's stack overflow. People just asking, hey, how do I do this? And somebody eventually replies with, oh, that's built in already. Right. I can do that. But it would be kind of interesting to have a, a scheduled just group hangout where people share like the coolest thing that they learned recently. And Oh, that's people, interesting. And other people could just say, I thank you. I didn't know that that was a thing. That's interesting. Um, and, and then, you know, probably someone else says, oh yeah, that's been around since blah, blah, blah. And here are some other things you can do that are similar because they already know about it. But organizing that and getting people to show up and that, that's also work. Sure. That's another thing that might be really cool to just have, I don't know how many people you could get on that, but I imagine you would need more than two Yeah. to do maybe like a Twitch stream or something, right? Like, mm. I don't know. That sounds, that sounds interesting. So th I think this is an interesting talk. I mean, we've kind of rambled all over the place, but um, yeah. I think it's a thing that I think about all the time. I, I constantly want us to do better, to manage better. And I feel like there's not a single answer that sort of works for everybody, but it's these sort of like gradiated things where you choose what, what do you choose to invest your time in and why? Um, yeah. I'm really curious what people have to say. Let's uh, wrap it up there. This is good yeah. chat. Thanks. Good Thanks chat. for joining us. <laughs> <laughs>